Uh, If you brought your Bible, please open with me to that passage, Genesis chapter 3. We are going to be working through verses 1 through 7 this morning. It is such a delight and an honor to be with you uh, this morning. I am so thankful that uh, our sovereign God decided not to send a foot of snow in less than two hours during our uh, worship gathering, uh, making travel prohibitive this Sunday. Uh, I I hope you were able to uh, have a a nourishing time in the Word, uh, home alone. Uh, Yet last Sunday, I know my, my, my wife and kids and I, we were able to eat a ridiculously big breakfast uh, in our home, and and I got to give them the pre-sermon. Uh, so they've already heard this. Uh, we did it more as a Bible study uh, last week, and um, it, no spoilers, okay, uh, kids, uh, as we unpack it uh, this morning. We, we've been working our way through the book of Genesis, the, the book of beginnings, and we've been asking ourselves as we've been working through these passages. Passages, uh, some big questions, because the, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, uh, gives us our origin story, the, the story of God and the, the origin of humanity as we know it. And as the story unpacks, we, we, we are able to answer some big questions for our lives because it goes back to the uh, original story of, of how and why we were created. So if you remember back a number of weeks ago, we, we started out with the question just asking, well, what's your story? Where, where did you come from? How, what, what is your, how, how has your story been shaped over the course of your life? And we asked another question of like, what's your purpose in life. And last, uh, or two weeks ago, we, we asked the question, who are your people? What, what's your community? Who do you belong to? E- each and every one of these questions, these big questions, uh, are informed by our origin story in the book of Genesis, namely the opening uh, few chapters of Genesis. Well, today's question is a little bit heavier. Today's question might be one that we we don't want to ask ourselves too often, but if we're honest with ourselves, each and every one of us in this room answers this question in in some way. So I'm just going to throw it out there for us to sit in just for a moment, and then we're going to unpack the scriptures together. The big question from this text is this, what are you ashamed of? What are you ashamed of? Now, it might might not be something big. It might might not be something that you have control over. Some of you might say, you know what? I'm I'm, I'm kind of ashamed of my height. I wish I were a little bit taller, as the famous theologian Skilo said in 1998. But some of us might have some other things that we were in control of that we just don't like to make public. Like, you know what I wish? Wish I would have finished high school. Wish I would have persisted through college. Wish I would have been a little bit more attentive to my children as they were growing up. And then some of us have things in our lives or in our past that we wouldn't want to share with anyone ever. They're so dark and shameful. Things like, I hope that nobody in this room ever finds out that I had an abortion. Or I hope nobody in all of existence ever has the movie Uh, the documentary of my life that plays out before them uh, when I was 18 to 22 years old. I just hope that that time period of my life is just erased because I'm so ashamed. The unfortunate reality of every person in this room is that we all have very specific things that we would answer that question with. What are we ashamed of? But thankfully, God has not left us alone in our guilt and in our shame, and he's given us ways in which we are called and invited to deal with our shame. 
to not just process through it in a psychologically healthy way, but to reveal it to our God who created us so that we might be freed from our guilt and our shame. And the big idea for the message this morning is this, we should resist temptation through shameless satisfaction in Christ. We should resist temptation through shameless satisfaction in Christ. And we're gonna see this in three primary scenes that are unpacked for us in Genesis 3, verses one through seven. First, we're gonna see the shrewd serpent. And then we are gonna see the shrewd serpent's seductive scam. And lastly, we are gonna see how that results in the shame of sin. Let's lighten it up a little bit here. I sense a, a bit of heaviness, and I invited you to uh, enter into this heaviness with me, but let's lighten it up a little bit. Uh, what's your favorite animal? It's an easier question than what are you ashamed of. What's your favorite animal? I heard a lion, that's a good one. Uh, uh, some, if you were to ask this to a normal person, they'd probably say like a, a lion or a, a tiger or a bear or uh, maybe even a husky, uh, maybe, maybe a dog or a cat. Uh, we, all, we all have like a favorite animal. Uh, a few summers ago, my family and I, we were on a vacation with my extended family and my youngest nephew on uh, the Anderson side of the family uh, was five years old at the time. We were, in Yellow, we were in Yellowstone together. And so obviously there's a number of animals in Yellowstone with uh, buffalo and, and uh, animals along those lines. So I, I turned to my youngest nephew and said, hey, what's your favorite animal? thinking that he was going to see, say, like a grizzly bear of Yellowstone or a buffalo, or they live in the, in the north woods of Wisconsin. So I still thought maybe like a wolf, uh, that, that, that might be something that, they, that he would like. And without even missing a beat, he turns to me and he says, a snake. <laughs> what five-year-old would confess before his uncle that his favorite that his favorite animal is a snake and sure enough he would tell me all of these facts about anacondas and pythons and cobras he was not he was not joking for even a moment that his favorite animal was a snake and as a 5 year old with an uncle like me i felt my obligation to my younger brother and my sister in law to say to my youngest nephew at the time, you want to do something fun? Come, let's, why don't you come over to Uncle Carl and Aunt Andrea's house, and we're going to see a great movie. It's going to be a fun movie. It's called Snakes on a Plane. I said it in the presence of my brother and sister-in-law so that they would know that I was just a joke, and my brother rolls his eyes as as large as he possibly can, and my sister-in-law immediately stepped in and rebuked me and said, no, uh, son, Uncle Carl is being silly. We are never watching that movie. So for the remainder of our vacation, uh, my, five, my five-year-old nephew, Uncle Carl, when are we going to watch Snakes on a Plane? <laughs> Almost no one has their favorite animal as a snake. Most five-year-olds in particular are scared of snakes. They're terrified of them, and they run in the opposite direction. In chapter 3 of Genesis, it opens with a snake. Not a snake on a plane, but a snake in the garden. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. Now the term crafty here is the same word the Proverbs use as wisdom. It doesn't use, uh, most English translations translate it pejoratively or negatively as crafty, but it's the same word as wisdom. The, um, The serpent was the most intelligent 
of the beasts of the field the author wants to clue people into. The English translations use crafty because the way in which he is going to use his intelligence is not for God-honoring or God-glorifying purposes as we see in the book of Proverbs. His craftiness is going to be used for means of deception, but, which, which, at, which forces us to ask the question, where in the world did the serpent come from? Now, we might be tempted to go to different places of the scripture and uh, assign a spiritual quality to this particular serpent uh, as pre-existing uh, before, uh, before the garden was made, but, but look in particular what the text actually tells us about this serpent. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. Notice how it modifies and describes the serpent. That the Lord God had made. Now we've just walked through the opening chapters of Genesis. Everything that God made was created and it was good. From the beasts of the field to the birds of the air to the fish of the sea, even to humanity itself, we were created good. But now we have the introduction of a character into the story who is going to use his intelligence and craftiness in a way that God has not designed. At some point, that which God has created good was going to be manipulated for purposes outside of God's good intention. And the narrator clues you in by saying that the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Isn't it amazing how good things can go bad rather quickly? The same discovery of nuclear power that has the ability to power an entire city with clean energy can also detonate a bomb that is so destructive that an entire city could be leveled. The internet and the, our, our smartphones that we have in our hands can instantly communicate, instantly uh, connect us with, with loved ones all over the world to where we can see their face and they can see our face. We can communicate with them and, and pray with them and, and connect with them in meaningful ways just with a, a simple device. But that same device that can be used for good, healthy communication with loved ones can also deliver an untold amount of evil images that desecrate the very bodies that we have been given as humanity. Isn't it amazing how quickly something designed good can turn for evil? When the man was in the garden, his charge was to work it and to keep it but he must also remain vigilant, vigilant, on guard from lies. God has taught him the truth and taught him how to walk in the truth. He shouldn't be swayed by the craftiness of creation. The intrusion of the shrewd serpent into God's good garden from the very outset should cause us to ask ourselves the question, are we alert? Our, is our, are our eyes open? Are we remaining diligent to discern what is good and what is not good and protect ourselves and our loved ones? from the deception and the craftiness of that which twists God's good design for evil purposes? Do we understand God's word with the level of precision necessary and internalized it to such a degree that we can spot a phony, a crafty scam artist whose intentions are twisted? The uh, story would be very different, and the story would be over very quickly 
if the introduction of the serpent into the, the shrewd serpent into the garden was responded to by the man taking out his shovel, cutting off its head, and burying it just outside of the garden, saying, you don't belong here. But that's not what happened in the garden when the snake slithered his way into humanity's abode, dwelling place. The serpent, verse 1 continues, said to the woman, did God actually say? The serpent begins with a theological question. The serpent engages with the woman, desiring for her to take the clickbait trap of entering into a fruitless theological exchange about God's word. Did God actually say? Was God actually clear about these things? Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Was God really clear that you can't eat any tree from the garden? Notice how he generalizes God's command earlier in chapter 2 to set a trap by just entering into the conversation. If she begins to enter into the conversation about what God's word actually says, she's already taken the bait. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? You can almost see the slithering of the snake's constriction wrapping around her ankle as she, as the serpent asks the woman just a simple, simple question about God's word. She takes the bait. And the woman says to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, repeating again, uh, chapter two, verse 26, or sorry, verse 16. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, any tree of the garden, Verse three, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. She's rehearsing what God had said to the man in chapter two, verse 16. Now, just a, uh, a precise reading of the text will, will, will reveal to us that we don't know if God communicated this command directly to the woman or not. Because in chapter 2, verse 16, God communicates with the man. The, the woman did, wasn't even uh, a creation at this point. God communicates to the man in chapter 2, verse 16, this particular command. So while it is possible that God could have spoken the exact same clear command to the woman as, uh, as God did to the man, most likely God communicated to the man and it was the man's job to teach his wife this is what God has said to instruct her, to let her know this is the, 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 the rules that, that God has provided for our good and for our flourishing. And she does pretty good to start by saying, we can eat of any tree, we just can't eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. But then she does something that most people skip over. She adds a rule to God's word. Notice in chapter two, verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you eat of it, you shall surely die. Did he say anything about touching it? There's nothing in there about touching it. The woman whether it's a wise restriction or not a wise restriction, she adds something to God's command. Neither shall you touch it. Which God did not say to this point. Lest you die. 
So she responds in a way that, that, that is uh, faithful to what, God has, to what God has said, but the very fact that she was willing to enter into the discussion reveals that she's clicked on the link from the Nigerian prince that has $3 million to deposit in anyone's bank account who is willing to share with them. It's a scam. The serpent wasn't opening up a conversation because he genuinely wanted to conform his existence and pattern it after the word of God. He had evil intentions. And we see those evil intentions on full display now that he slithered his way around her ankle and he is about to take a bite. A deep bite that's going to inject the venom of deception into her very spiritual DNA. And he does so through means of seductive flattery. Verse four. But the serpent said to the woman, flat out lie, you will not surely die. That thing that you're scared of, that death thing that you haven't experienced yet, yeah, that's not a thing. Surely you will not die. And then... He justifies his lie of not going to die with flattery of her. He tells her, God knows that you're going to be his competition. God knows that when you take a bite of this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're not simply going to be human, you're going to be divine. You're going to be a goddess. Girl, stop apologizing. Be all that you can be. Do all that you desire to do. Look at what he says. Verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You're going to see things that he doesn't want you to see. He's withholding something from you. Your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God. You won't just be made in his image. You yourself will be divine. Girl, you'll be a goddess. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You won't need a God to tell you what is right and what is wrong and to walk in what is right and resist that which is wrong. You'll be able to determine it for yourself. You will be 100% independent from God, and God doesn't want you to eat of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he doesn't want any competition. And he knows that you can exceed him if you just taste and experience the goodness of the fruit of this tree. And now we see the the venom of deception is in her bloodstream. She's really taken taken the bait. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food... There's something about the nutrients that this tree has that if I eat it, it's going to be a superfood. I am going to be nourished to such a degree that I am going to have superhuman powers. It's good for food. This is good for me. I'm going to be healthier than God. I'm going to be stronger than God. I'm going to be more sustainable than God. All I need to do is eat this food, this tree, this, this fruit. It's good for food. and that it was a delight to the eyes. God is withholding beauty from me. This is aesthetically pleasing. Look at how beautiful this fruit is. You know what? If I just take a bite of this beautiful food, I'm going to be beautiful. God is withholding beauty from me by prohibiting me to eat of this beautiful, beautiful food. 
I not only want to be super healthy, I want to be ridiculously beautiful. It's pleasing to the eyes for food. And that the tree was desired to make one wise. God is withholding intelligence and wisdom from me. There is something that he does not want me to know. And if I were to participate and take and partake of a bite of this fruit, he knows that I'm going to be just as smart as he is. I'm going to have just as much knowledge as he has. He's holding back on giving me that which I desire to become wise. The seductive scam was in full, full effect. In verse 6, we see her just mulling over these things, fantasizing about what her life would be how healthy she would be if she ate of this fruit, how beautiful she would be if she was able to just taste of that which is forbidden, and how intelligent and wise she would be if she just took one simple bite. The serpent knew the the way into the woman's heart was through flattery and seduction with smooth, wise, intelligent words, letting her know, deceiving her into thinking that God's good purposes and intentions for her are not enough, that she needs something more to fulfill the reason for why she was created. And with just a simple, unelaborate sentence, Evil itself was injected into humanity's bloodstream. Up until this point in the story, humanity knew what evil was. It's that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If I take and eat of that tree, then that's evil. They would know it experientially by resisting temptation from participating in it. But at the very moment they take and eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they themselves now become evil. Verse 6 continues. She took of its fruit and ate. A simple, humble bite, thinking that it would fulfill her desires. She took of its fruit and she ate. Now, at this point of the story, the original reader, you you and me, as we're reading the story, if we're reading it with fresh eyes, the same question should be on everybody's mind. Where in the world is her husband? Why in the world is her husband just letting her fend for herself before this seductive scam artist? Why is her husband allowing for her to enter into this dialogue with this scam artist that, is, that has evil intentions for her? Where is he? What is he up to? Why is he not defending her? Why is he not protecting her? And verse 6 tells us exactly where he was. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Hers was a sin of initiative. She had thought, thought it through. She was thinking about all of the, the lies that the serpent has said to her. And she said, yes, that's what I want. And she took of its fruit and she ate it. His was a sin of complicity. His was a sin of apathy and laziness. His wife eats of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She hands it over to him. Okay, honey, if that's what you want to do, sure. And all of humanity was plunged into death and destruction because the man was not spiritually alert. Because he did not protect his wife. 
because he allowed for an intruder into his garden and permitted the intruder to have his way with his own wife. How easy is it of us to repeat this same act again and again in our day, this seductive scam? The story of the seductive scam reveals our innate ability now to be satisfied in in anything apart from God. We, We scroll through social media on our phone while driving a vehicle, And that would have been unimaginable a few hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago today. Simply because we think, you know what, we don't need to play by the rules. I saw a video last week of a a train driver who was coming into a station at full speed. The, The driver was on their phone just scrolling away. The driver wasn't asleep at the wheel, the driver was distracted and plowed its train right into the next, into the next train, sending the passengers and the, the train in front of it and the passengers behind into an utter, into utter chaos. The person's thinking, well, social media is satisfying, and this train basically drives itself. Why do I need to be alert? Now, I don't think social media is sinful, but I do know that my heart is far too easily satisfied in things that are less than God's intention for me. And this moment of the seductive scam captures all moments of humanity's sin. Each sinful desire, each sinful thought, each sinful word and deed is a rehearsal of the taste of the forbidden fruit. Our sinful propensity to delight ourselves in things that are far less glorious than God's purpose is repeated in every human from this point of the first man and the first woman, this point forward. If the man had been intentionally pursuing the joy of his wife, if the man had been alert, then his satisfaction would have peaked in protection of her from God's enemy. If the woman had been delighted in the joy of her obedience to the Lord, if the woman had guarded her heart from forbidden fantasies, if the woman had not entertained the possibility of becoming divine herself, she would have run to her husband and she would have said, uh, like my wife does when a spider is in our bathroom, honey, can you please take care of this? And to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, their problem wasn't that they were seeking after greater satisfaction than what God offered. Their sin revealed that they were far too easily pleased with something far less than what God offers. And it's not just true of the first man and the first woman, it's true of you and it's true of me. We have thousands of years of church history and faithful men and women who followed Jesus obediently, served as our examples. We know that healthy followers of Jesus know Christ, grow in Christ, share Christ with the world, yet we become so satisfied with things that are far less than that in our spiritual walk. The truth of God's word is that we have everything that we need as a church right now right here in this spiritual garden that God has created for us for Sierra Bible Church to thrive. Everything that we need. We have the word of God sufficient for the truth, for for all truth, for salvation and godliness. We have the fellowship of believers that, that meets regularly, stirring one another up to love and good works. We have the second most unchurched city in the United States of America to reach for the gospel. We don't lack resources. We don't lack people. We don't lack education. We don't lack facilities. We lack a desire for godliness. We lack a zeal for holiness. 
We lack a fervency to see God's glory be held in worship and enjoyed in every one of our gatherings. Yes, there are snakes that will slither their way into our garden that need to be removed. But our biggest problem is not the outside intruders of the snakes. Our biggest problem is us. Like the woman, many of us fantasize about what sin can provide for us. God is withholding something from me. But we don't call it sin. We sanitize our language and fantasize about perfect health, dazzling beauty, and unparalleled wisdom. And like many of, like the man, many of us, we're just along for the ride. Don't intrude into my life. Just let me do my thing. Let me just continue to coast until I go home. We don't call it sin, but we make excuses. It's too hard to study the word of God. It's too messy to get involved in people's lives within the church. It's too laborious to adorn the gospel among those who do not yet believe. The man and the woman didn't believe God. They thought that their sin wasn't a big deal. But the results were immediate. Then the eyes of both were opened in verse 7. They realized for the very first time, they're sinners. They knew that they were naked. Now let me ask a question, what changed? What changed from two seconds before they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to two seconds afterwards. Physically, nothing changed. They still had all the same body parts, but before they ate of the fruit, they were naked and they were innocent. Nothing to be ashamed of. After eating the fruit, they were naked, sinful, and guilty and ashamed. They weren't embarrassed by their nakedness before they ate of the fruit. But after they ate of it, they were ashamed of their sinfulness. Their eyes were open. They knew that their life was sinful and they needed to be covered. They experienced shame. Now, at this point of the story, the man and the woman, they could have come clean. They could have come running to God naked and in their sin exposed, pleading, God, forgive me. Give me mercy. What have we done? They could have asked God, God, cover our sin, cover our shame, restore your glory in us. We are so sorry. But that's not what they did. They did exactly what every person, including myself, does in this room when we experience sin. We try to hide it. Rather than confess their sin to God and ask for forgiveness, look at what verse 7 says. And they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loincloths. This is not a verse about the very beginning of fashion. This is a verse about the unwillingness of the human heart, including mine, to come clean before God with confession of our sin and to try to cover over our shame with our own works. They tried to cover their sins themselves. They tried to cover what they were ashamed of with their own works. If nobody sees, it's going to be good enough. I'm going to be fine. We're just going to keep on with life as if nothing ever happened. And humanity has done the exact same thing from that very moment. Remember what I asked in the very beginning of this message? What are you ashamed of? It could be a million different things. But whatever that thing is that comes to your mind, that's the thing that's keeping you from accomplishing God's purpose in your life. That thing that you're hiding, thing that you don't want anybody else to see, is the very thing that God desires to uncover lovingly, to show you his mercy, to show you his grace, and to send you on a mission to glorify him for the rest of your existence. Whatever you're unwilling to bring before him, you're, you're sewing together spiritual fig leaves and trying to hide from him. The bad news is you're not hiding anything from God. He sees right through your fig leaves. He knows that you've sinned. He sees your spiritual nakedness. 
But you know what this passage has done for me in these, in this, these last now two weeks of studying it in depth? Uh, in depth? As I'm thinking through the, the very first origin of our, our shamefulness and our guilt, this probably won't come as a surprise to many of you who've been here around for a while, but it's just helped me see the beauty of the cross. The beauty of the crucifixion of Jesus. A moment before the man and the woman ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were naked and innocent. Instantaneously, after they took of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were naked and guilty and ashamed. I was reading through the Gospels and the accounts of the crucifixion and in the Jewish context, uh, crucifixion was very shameful. In fact, to such a degree, most crucified criminals were crucified naked. The Gospels never go into detail, go into detail about it because it's shameful to even speak in such a way. But each one of the Gospels does bring up this point as Jesus is being crucified in John chapter 19, verse 23. It says this, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his garments, his clothes, the last of his earthly possessions. They took his garments, divided them into four parts, and a number of scholars says this is just like his, his head covering, his outer garment, his belt, his shoes, divided them into four parts, and so that the soldiers in customarily would, would get remuneration for their work. One part for each soldier, soldier and his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from the top to bottom. I think John especially inserts this detail not only to show how Jesus fulfilled the suffering Davidic Messiah of Psalm 22 that he'll quote in the next passage, but I do also think that he adds this detail to let you know that Jesus experienced the shame of nakedness, of being spiritual, of feeling the shame of the sin to such a degree that he was fully exposed. Now, if we take the rest of, if we take the rest of the New Testament seriously, which like all of the rest of, which all of us should, we, we know that from uh, 2 Corinthians 5, that God made him who knew no sin. Jesus had no sin in and of himself. He was genuinely innocent. So as he is experiencing the shame of the cross in his own body, he's not experiencing the shame of the things that he has done. He's experiencing the shame of the things that you have done. If that doesn't melt your heart for the love of God through the cross of Jesus Christ, you haven't begun to understand the depth of your guilt and your shame before God. But if you have, and you realize that your life is not the perfect reflection of the glory of God, that you haven't walked in accordance with the, the, the ways in which he designed you, you will see the shame of the cross and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for taking on yourself what belonged to me, which means we, you and I, can boldly come before him with all of our guilt all of our shame, fully exposed, and ask for his covering and his forgiveness. And because he went to the cross for you and rose from the dead on your behalf, he will clothe you with his righteousness so that you can live shamelessly before him entirely satisfied in everything that he has done for you. And therefore, walking with Christ doesn't become 
a ritualistic demand to obey all of the rules following Christ becomes an invitation to experience the life that you were designed for. Free from guilt, free from shame, to know him, to grow in him, and to share him and his life with the world. So we're going to close this thing down by participating in the Lord's Supper, a remembering of the cross. And as we are coming forward to uh, partake of the elements, I'm going to ask you to uh, bring that thing that you are ashamed of in your mind and in your heart, take of the elements, return back to, re- return back to your seats, and just reflect on the reality that Jesus' body was made shameful to cover your shame, that Jesus' blood was shed to reconcile you to God so that you can live free from the guilt and free from the shame. Now, if you've never experienced, if you've never taken that step of faith to trust Jesus for the very first time, we invite you to not participate in the Lord's Supper this morning, but we do invite you to take that step verbally by speaking with myself. I'll be right up here at the end of the service or with one of a member of our elders teams that can walk you through what it means to start following Jesus for the very first time. If you are a believer in Jesus, we invite you to celebrate the reality that Jesus has died for your shame, died for, and, and was punished for your guilt and that you can walk freely and shamelessly in and through him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your work on our behalf on the cross. God, we ask that that we would not rehearse the pattern of the original sin, the originating sin, but that we would, by your grace, turn from our sin to celebrate the clothing that we have in you. God, we ask that you would help us to know you, to grow in you, and to share you with the world. God, we ask that we would resist temptation to find our existence apart from you and that we would run to you, the one who clothes us in righteousness, covers our shame, and allows us to live the life that you've designed us to live. God, help us to fix our thoughts and our minds entirely upon you, to receive the the cleansing of your mercy and to walk free from the crippling, debilitating, work of shame in us and glorify you for the work that you have done on our behalf on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray.